Are you not sure what all of the pins, plugs, and slots do on a motherboard? Well, I'm going to clear that up for you. Mike here with Tectonic Systems. Welcome back to the channel. Let's dive right in. The first thing on a motherboard that you'll probably see is this part right here. This is called the central processing unit socket or CPU socket. And this is where you'll install your CPU. This particular socket is an AM5, but when you're selecting a motherboard and CPU, you have to pick a CPU that will fit in the socket of the motherboard that you have. The black cover here is used to protect the socket from damage. And I would recommend keeping that in case you ever need to store your motherboard or ship it back for an RMA. To power the CPU, there are ATX 12 volt ports typically located in the upper left corner of the motherboard. These may vary from one four pin port to in the case of this motherboard, one eight pin port and one four pin port. And some motherboards may actually have two eight pin ports. The power supply is gonna have dedicated cables for this. And if you don't know about power supply cables, I'll link my video in the description that discusses all of that. Now, next to the CPU socket are these long slots. These are called DIMM slots, and this is where the system's random access memory or RAM modules get installed. This board's DIMM slots are DDR5 and require DDR5 memory, but you can get motherboards with other generations like DDR4 slots, which would require DDR4 memory modules. Memory modules are not backward or forward compatible. So when you purchase memory modules, make sure you're getting the correct DDR version that your motherboard supports. One thing to note about DIMM slots is that they are labeled A1, A2, B1, and B2, when in a four slot configuration. You do not want to randomly select slots to install RAM into, and you also don't want to install from left to right. Notice how this board has A2 and B2 labeled as first. This is because these are the slots that you would need to use in a two memory module configuration. The reason for this can vary, but the overarching thing to know is that most motherboards will recommend using these two slots due to how the board is made and default configurations of the BIOS and how memory is initialized during boot. If you aren't sure on your board, the motherboard manual will tell you which slots to use. Before we move forward, let's talk about something called a header. A header is a set of pins that are designed to do a specific job for the motherboard. Since it's designed to do something specific, the component that uses this header is also very specific. The first headers I'm going to show you are the CPU fan and AIO pump headers. These two headers will typically be located where they are on this motherboard or somewhere in the very close vicinity of the CPU socket. If you have a heatsink attached to your CPU that is cooled by a fan, you would utilize the CPU fan header to provide power and pulse width modulation or PWM control for the CPU fan. PWM will allow the speed of the fan to vary. If you have an AIO water cooler, you would plug your AIO pump into the AIO pump header. One thing to note about these headers is that you could technically plug your CPU fan into the AIO pump header and vice versa for the AIO pump in the CPU fan header. They are both electrically providing the same power and they are pinned out in the same exact way. The only difference will most likely just be different default configurations, i.e. the CPU fan header will have a fan curve programmed while the AIO header will most likely just run at full speed. These can both be changed in the BIOS or in the OS with your motherboard software. But just something to note as you won't break or harm anything if you plug the opposite into one of those headers. One other thing to note is that motherboard manufacturers like to add proprietary headers to their boards and in the case of this board, NZXT has added their own proprietary RGB headers. I'm not going to cover the proprietary headers because it's specific just to the motherboard in question. Moving from those headers now to the right of the dim slots are system fan headers one and two. This is the exact same header type as the CPU fan and can be used to power and control the speed of any fan that you install into your system. These system fan headers can be located in many different spots on the motherboard and they may be labeled chassis fan as well. The big port is the motherboard's main power distribution point. A 24 pin ATX cable from your power supply will plug in and is a standard port on every motherboard. The only thing that will vary is the orientation of the port. Some motherboards may have it on the side and others like this one will have it facing 
up. This header right here is used to plug in your front panel USB-C cable. It's a USB 3.2 Gen 2 and the corresponding cable will come with your PC case if your PC has a front panel USB-C port. Here on the side, you'll typically find at least one USB 3.2 Gen 1 header and these are also for your front panel ports. Again, the corresponding cables will come with your PC case. These are part of a group of headers that will allow all of the ports on the front panel of your PC case to communicate with your system and work as designed and we'll be talking about a few more as we travel around the connections on the board in this same general area you'll also typically find your sata ports these are used to connect storage devices to your motherboard like older platter 3.5 inch hard drives and 2.5 inch solid state drives and yes I fully believe there is still a place for platter hard drives in modern builds. Next up is probably the most confusing header of all, or the easiest one of all depending on your PC case. This is the front panel header. This header provides connectivity to your PC case's power and reset buttons, as well as providing power to any power button LEDs, or if your case has a hard drive activity light, this is where it will also get power from. Some cases come with a single unified plug that you line up and plug right in, and other cases will have individual plugs for all of the front panel items. These use each header appropriately, and you have to follow the diagram of the pinout for each plug to make sure you are plugging things in correctly. Like I said, either the easiest plug or the most confusing and difficult plug. Some motherboards may have a built-in power and reset button like on this one, and this just allows you to turn the system on easily with the push of a power button or reboot if it is hanging during boot. I would say these are more overclocking features as it makes running the board outside of a PC case a much better experience than having to jump the pins on the front panel connector to power on the board. So if you're doing a bench build, this is something that is a really nice feature. We'll move past the next three headers as they are NZXT proprietary headers. And then the next three headers on this board are System Fan 3, 4, and 5. Like I said earlier, these headers are usually spread around the board to provide easier cable routing for fan cables. Again, these can also be used to power pumps for water cooling loops. Next, we have USB 2.0 headers. These are interesting because one may be used to provide connection to front panel USB ports, but they can also be used by extra devices in your build to communicate with the system. Maybe you wanna add a fan controller or a diagnostic card that displays postcodes or other information. Either way, they are nice to have on a motherboard. The next header that you'll come across is the five volt ARGB header, which handles your addressable RGB components. This could be lights on a GPU water block or just a strip of LEDs that you add to the system. It's the most common RGB header you'll come across. There are other RGB headers that are older, but these older headers do not allow each individual LED to be addressable. Make sure you're using the right header for your RGB device, or you will most likely damage the RGB device if you don't. They'll typically say what header to use in the instructions if you're unsure. The last header I have to talk about on this motherboard is the front panel audio connector. Yes, another front panel connector but this one is easy to plug in and it handles being able to use the headphone and microphone jacks on your PC case if you would like to. The corresponding cable will be included with your PC case. These long slots here are your PCI Express slots, and this is where you can plug things in like graphics cards, sound cards, and NVMe expansion cards. You'll have to read your manual to find specifically what generation the PCI slot on your motherboard is, and each one might be different. Typically, the top slot is going to be the fastest and newest generation slot, and is where you will want to put your graphics card if your build has one. For this motherboard, the top slot is a generation 5 PCI slot while the two below are generation 4. Now most motherboards nowadays have removable metal plates like these. These usually act as heat spreaders for the NVMe slots that sit underneath, meaning that they passively help cool your NVMe storage devices. These slots right here are NVMe slots, and this is where you would plug your NVMe storage drives into. This little card right here is the motherboard's built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth controller if your motherboard has that feature set, and it will come pre-installed. This silver puck is a battery, and it is called the CMOS battery. It provides the system power when it is turned off, which allows your system to keep all of the BIOS settings changes you have made and the system time when the PC is off. If you take it out, 
it will reset your BIOS back to default factory settings and lose the system time, and it might cause problems with booting. So this is one of those components that can be a huge piece of troubleshooting a system that is having issues. The battery will also come pre-installed. Speaking of troubleshooting, most motherboards will have diagnostic LEDs that show what part of the power on self-test or post it is in. There's a CPU, DRAM, VGA, and boot LED. If the post fails, the LED of the component that failed the post will stay lit, helping you identify and troubleshoot the issue. For example, if the RAM modules are causing your system to not pass post, the DRAM LED will stay lit, showing you where in the post process the system failed. Now up last is your rear input output panel or IO panel. Typically you will have an HDMI port on the motherboard in case if your CPU has a built-in graphics chip. This is also where your Wi-Fi antennas plug into and you will also have all of the motherboard's built-in USB ports and your ethernet port. If you want to hardwire your system to your network, the ethernet port is what you'll use. Most boards will also have some form of rear audio ports, including microphone, and in this case, a Sony Philips digital interface or SPDIF out. This would allow easy connection to a home theater system, soundbar, or other high-end speaker systems. That's it. That is usually what you will find on a motherboard in terms of connection capabilities. It's not super complex once you learn what each thing is and does, and it becomes a lot less overwhelming. And like I said, some boards will have proprietary headers for very specific things, but overall, the things I went over, you will find on almost every single motherboard. There are some older outdated headers that may pop up, but new generation components will not be using those headers. I hope this helped you understand better what all of the things on your motherboard are and what they are used for. That's all the time I have for today's video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.